So I'm Chris Schaffhoser. I'm a faculty member in the math department and a member of the organizing committee here. So I'm very honored to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Talithia Williams. Um, and so Dr. Williams earned her bachelor's degree in math from Spelman University, a master's of math from Howard University, and a master's and a PhD in statistics from Rice University. She's now an associate professor at Harvey Mudd College doing research in statistics. Um, where she develops uh, statistical models which emphasize the um, spatial and temporal structure of data and applies them um, to problems in the environment. Dr. Williams has uh, worked with the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratories, the NSA and NASA, and she has partnered with the World Health Organization in developing a cataract model used to predict and, uh, sorry, in developing a cataract model used to predict the cataract um, surgical rates for countries in Africa. So renowned for her popular uh, TED Talk, Own Your Body's Data, uh, Dr. Williams takes sophisticated numerical concepts and makes them understandable to wide audiences. Uh, she demystifies the mathematical process in assuming, or in amusing and insightful ways, using statistics as a way of seeing the world in a new light and transforming our future through the bold and new possibilities inherent in STEM fields. Um, she has served on several boards, including the um, MMA, SACNAS, and the EDGE Foundation. In 2015, she won the Mathematical Association of America's uh, Henry Alder Award for distinguished, distinguished Teaching by a beginning college or university mathematics faculty member, which honors faculty members whose teaching is um, effective and extraordinary and extends its influence beyond the classroom. Uh, Dr. Williams is co-host of the PBS series uh, Nova Wonders, which premiered in April of 2018, and she's delivered speeches nationally and internationally on uh, the value of statistics and quantifying personal health information. Uh, she offered the book, uh, Power in Numbers, uh, the, Rebel, the Rebel of Women in Mathematics. Uh, Dr. Williams received the uh, 2022 Joint Policy Board for Mathematics uh, Communication Award for bringing mathematics and statistics into the homes of millions uh, through her work as a TV host, um, renowned speaker and author. And Dr. Williams was our plenary speaker at this co conference which held virtually last year and she was um, generously agreed to come back in, in person this year, and we're, we're happy to have her here. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Talithia Williams. Um. All right, let's jump in. Um, I wanna talk a bit about uh, the power of talking and how we might use our platform to engage the public in mathematics. Um, you heard a little bit last night, I went to Spelman College undergrad, that's a historically black college for women in Atlanta. And one of my professors, Dr. Etta Faulkner, who I'm pictured there with, was really a mentor for me. Um, I wasn't thinking about graduate school when I was at Spelman. I was just like happy to be a math major, about to graduate and get a job. And so Dr. Faulkner was the first person who said, Talithia, have you thought about grad school? And I was like, anybody got time for that? I'm struggling, I'm barely getting through your abstract algebra class. Like, what, what am I gonna do in grad school? Um, and uh, I remember when she, and I also didn't know it was free, right? Because I was just like, who's gonna pay for that? And so she was like, oh, it's free, and here's a chart of what people make. Income, you know, as a function of your education level. I was like, ooh, how do I get to these PhD, MD people, like this high column over here on the right? Um, and so she and Dr. Sylvia Bozeman were some of my mentors at Spelman, and they really encouraged me to go to graduate school. They also had certain programs that they would send us to. So it wasn't any program, it was like, here are the ones that have really supported Spelman students in the past, where we know people on the faculty and we know that they're gonna sort of take you in and be really supportive of you. And so that was really important for me. Uh, I got my PhD in statistics at Rice University. Uh, got to Howard, um, I took a biostat selective, and we were looking at data of um, uh, uh, pregnant women, some of whom had smoked their pregnancy. So this was an old data set, like, you know, prior to us realizing that pregnancy, you know, uh, causes harmful effects to your baby. So we're looking at this data, and there were like, you know, a group of women who smoked during pregnancy and a, you know, a group of women who didn't. And so you compared their gestations and the baby's birth weight and like all this cool stuff. 
And so initially, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, duh, like, you know, of course you shouldn't smoke during pregnancy. So we're looking at the data. And for the smoking women, they had, you know, shorter gestation. So they were given birth at like 34 weeks, 33 weeks. Their babies had uh, low birth weight and they, they had lung issues, right? And so I'm thinking there's nothing remarkable about this linear regression. <laughs> and then our professor says, um, the tobacco industry fought the data, like in court. And their argument was like, well, this wasn't a trial. Like this is just, uh, you just analyzed observational data. You didn't do a trial. It's not an experiment. Uh, there are other factors. It could be correlated to race and ethnicity. And I was just like, just look at the data. Like it's obvious. Like you've got people from different races in both groups, you know? And so I just remember getting so heated in this biostat selective because I felt like the data like showed you that the only difference was cigarettes, was nicotine, and you hired lawyers to fight in court that you're, you know, that cigarettes don't affect, a, you know, a, a, a mother's child's health. Um, so of course they lost that case. So as a result of that case, every cigarette package has that little warning on it, like women who are pregnant or may become pregnant should not smoke. And that was the moment where I said, oh, I want to understand the power of data. To, uh, to, t to share information, to, to get the truth from information. And that was what made me switch from a PhD program in math to, to a PhD program in statistics. So that was sort of the defining moment. So you can be a second year grad student and still not really know what you wanna do in your life. Is that, that's the takeaway from that. That was like when I was like, I am leaving going to a statistics program. Um, here I am with my advisor, Dr. Kathy Enzer. Uh, this was graduation day. And then this other picture in the upper right corner, I, I spoke at the INFORMS conference, which is like an, or, an operations research group. And it was in Houston, so we met up for breakfast. Uh, this was, I think, literally back in October. You'll also notice that um, we had a little baby in tow. So my mom is holding an infant there, and I'm holding him too. That's Josiah. He's our now 14-year-old, so that was, yeah. Talk about a productive, I was productive in grad school, like just pushing out a baby, getting a PhD, you know. Um, my advisor, so uh, she would, <laughs> I would meet with her every Wednesday because I just needed the discipline. Like other, I'm a procrastinator, you know, by nature. And so she, she we have these weekly meetings every Wednesday. So sure enough, like clockwork, Tuesday, I'm, friend, I'm in the office like, oh, help me. Oh, I gotta get something to like show my advisor tomorrow so that I can like stay in this program. You know, I'm just like freaking out. Um, and so I'd come in Wednesday morning, like head down, well, I think I got something, I don't know. And she would always say, hello, future Dr. Williams. And I was like, have you seen my R code? Like you don't give PhDs out for this. <laughs> this is not why you give a PhD. You know. Uh, but she always affirmed me, right? Whenever I see her in the hallway, future Dr. Williams, I was like, you lying, just stop lying. <laughs> um, so I always remind her of that, that she believed in me even when I was just like not believing in myself. I spent three summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I worked in Lonnie Lane's lab and uh, worked on the Europa mission project. That was really great because it got me doing mathematical research and like and working in a, in a really diverse team of, of folks. Um, for the Europa Mission Project, I got to work on uh, like, like figuring out the type of solution to clean the outside of, the, of a probe. So we needed to sterilize it, but you also didn't want it to be so uh, potent that once you, got, once you get to Europa, you actually start to like kill off organisms around you, right? Because you're so sterile. And so that was one of the things that we worked on. Um, that mission is actually planned for October of 2024. So it was neat to see that something I worked on so many years ago is still uh, coming to fruition. I also spent a summer at the NSA, so shout out to, who was that? Was that Stephanie last night, yesterday, from the NSA? Um, it was great working there too, because it was like all these amazing mathematical minds uh, working for the government. You could only work 40 hours a week, so they, they were serious about like that clock out and go home, and every other Friday was a half day, because I'd end up working more hours during the day. Um, that was really great because I really got to sort of see, you know, mathematics in play, um, research mathematics, but also feel like I was really contributing. Um, I mean, the way you define contributing for the NSA, you know, it could be positive or negative, but doing something that really had, had value, you know, because I wasn't going to serve in the military, right? So that's like my closest thing to serving in the military was working at the NSA. Um, 
And I'm in the math department at Harvey Mudd College. One thing I love about Harvey Mudd is we try to be really intentional with um, recruiting diverse faculty, right? Because we want our students to see themselves represented in our discipline. We want them to look at our faculty and see themselves as mathematicians. And so I love that we try to communicate that visually. Um, because often the first thing you do, right, when we get our picture, a year from now, or we look back on this picture in 10 years, you're gonna, the first thing you're gonna do is look for yourself. You're like, oh yeah, where was I, right? And you look to find yourself. And subconsciously, that's what our students do, right? They look at a department and then they look for where they're represented in the department. So we really try to intentionally um, get faculty who let our students see that they too can be mathematicians and mathematical scientists. Okay, your turn, now that you're warmed up, why is it important to engage the public in the mathematical sciences? Let me just hear, stand up and use your, use your outside voice. Why is that important? Stand up and use our outside voice, yes. It applies to real world problems that affect everyone. Yes, all right, what else? Thank you, Perla. Right, we passed that trauma down. We're like, I hated it, and let me look, you're gonna hate it too. What else? Yes. Right, and why don't they know it already, right? Why, why is it that the default is it's hard and you should be afraid of it? Yeah, we gotta change that narrative, yes. Right, the connection between all the sciences, right? Math is sort of the underpinning of that. Yes. Oh my gosh, I love that. Ah, uh, yes, there's no math and non-math. Ah, uh, I'm gonna take that and use it in my next talk. Yes, <laughs> I'll give you credit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Understand how, yeah, how are you processing this information that you're being inundated with? Absolutely, yes. I see a hand here and then back there, yes. Uh, I find it important that everyone understand math and understand that it requires deep reflection. I think there's a reason that we understand numbers and other things. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We can sort of have a back and forth with numbers when we understand what they mean, yeah. There was a hand back there on the back, yep. Yes, how do you read all this data that you're given and understand it? Yes, I see one, two, three hands, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yes, behind, yeah. That's right, people don't even know what they can do with math, yes. There's a lot of people who use math on a daily basis and don't realize that they're doing it. Okay, that part, that part, yes. I see this hand back here, yes. Ooh, preach, preach. Other comments? Um, during COVID-19, uh, many of you may have seen this dashboard that Johns Hopkins put up, right? Um, we'd often maybe go there and refresh, how many new cases are there a day? Where are they occurring? Um, the statistician in me loved having access to this data, right? They made it free, it's available, you can download it, you can do whatever you want with it. It also gave, it was sort of the, the first time that I think the public was really invested in health data in a way that we hadn't been before, and also sharing health information, right? So lots of folks, you know, rarely do I say like, hey, I got my pap smear today, everything's good, post that on social media, like nobody needs to know, nobody, you know, but I, I there's a picture of me with a shot, with a, you know, with a Band-Aid, like, woo, I got boosted, like, I, you know, I got my vaccine. And so it's interesting that all of a sudden we were all sharing that we have gotten shots, you know. Um, 
And so this is a different way that the public was interacting with data and interacting with information, which is also why it's important that we help them understand that. Because you can look at those numbers and, and be like, this is overwhelming, but also what does it mean, right? And the average person isn't gonna pick up an article, you know, a journal article to read about the impact of COVID-19. They're gonna get it from the media, right? Their favorite form of media that they watch. How many of you heard about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment? Yeah. So when the vaccine first came out and it was available to, to senior uh, adults, uh, I was on the phone with my mom and I'm like, oh, mom, finally, you want me to make your appointment? Where do you want to go? Get your vaccine? And she was like, well, I don't know. And I'm like, what do you not know? There's nothing not know. What do you want to, I can like decipher any article. I can show you the data, uh, you know, <laughs> like, like your daughter, if, if anybody can prove it to you, like I am here to prove it. Um, and she said, well, now you know what happened in Tuskegee. And I was just like, well, yeah. And you know, we're from Georgia. So for, for her, she grew up, you know, 40 minutes from Tuskegee. And so this was just really very real in her generation because she grew up around families who were affected. For those of you who, who may not know, a, a lot of the mistrust in the African-American community stems from this experiment that was done by the US government. And so there was a, a group of men in Tuskegee, Alabama, some of whom had syphilis and some who did not. And they were a part of a part of a long-term study of the effect of syphilis. It was called the effect of syphilis, like untreated syphilis in the Negro male. And here's just sort of the, the timeline of that. So that, that study started in 1932 and uh, had 600 men, uh, some of whom about 400 had the disease, 399 had the disease, 201 of them did not. And then 11 years later, penicillin came out. And so penicillin's like, yes, like this will help, you know, treat syphilis, it became the drug of choice, but these men weren't given this drug, right? Even though it's out there and it, it would help mitigate uh, the effects of it. Oh, you can't see the numbers. Okay, that's 1932, 1943. In 1972, all right, so do the math, 32 to 72. 40 years. I thought that answer would have come out just a little quicker in this group, but you know, you know, you got to warm up. You got to warm up. 40 years, the Associated Press broke the story. They were like, yo, does anybody know that we still got these group of men in Tuskegee that have syphilis that we're not even treating? Like, is that, can we do that? Is that legal? 40 years later, the story broke. Then the following year, there was a class action lawsuit, right, against the U.S. government. Like, we're doing this to our own people. Um, so they sued, they won, they had an out of court settlement, right? Which is like, we're wrong, but please don't go to court because then, you know, we're, we're just really gonna be wrong and probably have to pay more than 10 million, which is like nothing, right? I mean, that's, that feels like nothing. In 1997, uh, Bill Clinton formally issued a presidential apology uh, for the study and to the participants. It wasn't until 2004, that the last person died, the last study participant died. Right? The last widow died in 2009 and there's still children who were now getting health benefits because their parents were a part of this study. Right? So uh, for a lot of folks in the, in the black community, you know, when, when they hear, oh, the government has come up with this new drug, it's like, oh, mm -mm. Like, we, we're, like we're not falling for that again. And so there was a lot of hesitancy to take it even though this was, this was a very different situation. And so what, what I often saw was you would see uh, stories of Dr. Kismikia uh, Corpit, uh, sorry, Dr. Kismikia Corbett, who was one of the uh, doctors who came up with the, with the vaccine, who worked at the NIH. And so she would be front and center, especially to different communities, to talk to them about how do we understand this data, but how do we also accept the fact that we've got a diverse team working on this vaccine, right? And diverse communities coming together to, to create a vaccine that's gonna impact everyone and, and not like apply to someone unequally. So here you see her with former President Trump, uh, with President Biden as well. And I love this quote. She says, diversity matters for the health outcomes of, our, of everyone, because it, if we're all gonna need the vaccines, then we've all gotta be working towards them. 
And that gets to the comment that you made about uh, the math community, right? Mathematics matters because we need everybody at the table. We need all of these diverse opinions at the table because it matters for all of us. Representation and visibility matter if we're gonna improve the public's perception of math and create an environment of inclusiveness, right? And that's gonna be a lot of Deanna's talk uh, later, and so I'm excited uh, to hear that as well. Okay, I, I wanna talk about sort of this, I don't think it's taboo, but it can somewhat be taboo in the math community when you start talking about public intellectualism and how do you engage the public in something that you're excited about and what's the value in that, right? Um, by definition, a public intellectual is just a person trained in a particular discipline, math, let's just say, who might be on the faculty of a college or university. This is how Allen defines it. This is his definition. Right? When such a person decides to write and speak to a larger audience, they become a, quote, public intellectual. Okay? You see that little cartoon there? Good morning. I'm a freelance public intellectual. Do you care for an opinion? <laughs> right? um, he defines different levels of this public intellectualism, different levels of how you might engage. Level one being you're strictly speaking to the public exclusively about your discipline. Right, I invite you to come, and you're like, yes, let me come, and here is all of my work that I've done toward my research, toward my thesis, toward my PhD, and I'm gonna communicate that to the public in some way. Right? We're all sort of, we, we all are level one. We've all done that, you're doing that at this conference, right? Communicating to the public exclusively about your discipline. Level two might be speaking and writing about your discipline, but also connecting it to how it relates to the world around you, right? So the social, the cultural, the political world around you. How is mathematics, how is statistics, right? How's algebraic topology connect in some way to this world around you, right? And then level three, he defines as a person that stands for something far larger than the discipline in which they originated, right? They're asked to speak about a range of topics outside of anything that they've ever done before. Um, Albert Einstein is a great example of that, right? He was asked to give these public address, uh, addresses on religion and education and all these topics of which he was not a scholar, but people valued his opinion so much, they also wanted to know what he thought about these other things, right? I would love to see more mathematicians in level two and three. Because I think that the way that we think about the world um, the way that we process information is useful to society. I see it in faculty meetings, <laughs> right? I see it just, just in, the, in the workings of the, a, a college or university when decisions have to be made. The math department is like, okay, well, uh, right, well, here's the data. And like the data logically lead to doing this. And, you know, I love my humanities colleagues. They'll be like, well, you know, I just feel... Ooh, I just, I just, mm, I just get a sense. And I'm like, but, but there's no, you know, like I appreciate your sense, but <laughs> here are the numbers. Based on the numbers, like we have like these two, like we can either do these two things or it's not gonna change the numbers, you know? So if you wanna do X, Y, Z, like, you know. And so in some ways, I think we're well poised to take that, that logical thinking and apply it in different areas as well because it's not intuitively how the public thinks about things, right? They think about it from a heart place and there, there's a space and time for that. Um, so I'd love to see more of us get into this realm. I think there are mathematicians who are starting to break that barrier. I wanna highlight a couple of them for you. This is, um, many of you know Ed Dre. Some of you may have gone to his talk at the joint math meetings. Edre uh, talks about, in this article in the New York Times, what it was like being sort of the only black mathematician in a space. He spent a number of years at Purdue on the faculty there before moving to Pomona College, so he's one of my colleagues in the Claremont Colleges. And he really talks about uh, this idea of belonging and what does belonging mean when we're in these spaces where we're the only. How do we create belonging? but also how do we seek out places that, that give us that belonging when we get there, right? So that the work's just not all on you to come and be a great grad student and create a great community, right? How do we create that space for you? 
Uh, Eugenia Chang also has been highlighted. Uh, she has this article, Want a Better Way to Understand to Think About Gender? Use Math, right? So taking mathematics and then connecting it to how we think about gender, right? Or looking at a magical curve or holiday lights and sturdy domes, right? And so these are pieces that connect her work as a mathematician to the broader world. She did an article, um, uh, an interview, where she talked about the experiences of, of racism that she experienced as an Asian woman and not fitting in, not, fi not fitting, uh, feeling prepared to be a woman in math. And then how doing abstract math, look at that, can stimulate empathy. What? I never thought when I was doing abstract algebra, like I was, Sorry that I had to do it. Like, that was the empathy I felt. Oh, I, like, I felt bad for myself. Um, but how is it that abstract math st can stimulate empathy? Right? Maybe it is because we struggle and we wrestle with something. Right? We don't get it immediately. It's not intuitive. And then once it does come, you're like, wow. Whew. Right? And so then when I run into someone else who's struggling, I'm like, oh, I get that. I know that feeling. I know what it's like to really work hard at something, to not get it and not get it and not get it, and then finally you see it, right? How does that stimulate empathy? Uh, Francis Sue has a book, The Mathematics of Human Flourishing. Anyone, how many of you have seen? Okay, okay, ish, ish. Um, he really talks about how math as a discipline can be more inclusive. And so it's not a math heavy book, it really is sort of a high level look at mathematics in general. And then how do you create something that the public sees as just this other that they hated and, and turn it into something that brings people together right? and causes human flourishing. Uh, there's a quote that Evelyn gave, uh, she did a, um, she uh, just did a, did a, this article in Scientific American that, that summarized the book and, and how great it was. And uh, I love what she said here. She says, mathematics for human flourishing is at once an invitation and a uh, manifesto. Sue's thesis is one that I share. Engaging with mathematics is an activity that enhances and en uh, enriches human lives. And everyone should feel welcome to participate in that activity. He organizes the book by what he labels as human desires, exploration, meaning, and play are a few. Each chapter explores the way the practice of mathematics can help fulfill one of these desires, along with the related virtues mathematics cultivates and the things that can get in the way of fulfilling those desires. What would it have been like to read a book like this in high school? How might that have changed the way we thought about mathematics? Or may have changed the way that, that women not in this room, who could have been in this room, thought about mathematics. Right? So that's what I mean. When I talk about engaging, it's engaging with, with the goal of opening it to folks who aren't at the table, right? to people who aren't in the room. Um, Ken Ono, does that name ring a bell? How many of you are like, Ken Ono, yeah, he's so awesome. He is so awesome. Uh, this is another picture. So this is uh, Ken Ono and, and Manjul, Manjul Bhargava. He's at Princeton. So these are like, you know, in the mathematics world, it's like, oh, Ken and Manjul. They're just, you know, the cream of the crop in the mathematical community. And they're amazing. And they're like kind people, right? So that's what you want. You want smart, genius, and nice, you know? Um, so that's Ken and Manjul. Uh, check this out though, so for the first 27 years of his life, the mathematician Ken Ono was a screw up, a disappointment and a failure. At least that's how he saw himself. As a teenager, Ono became so desperate to escape his parents' expectation that he dropped out of high school. He later earned admission to the University of Chicago, okay, impressive but had an apathetic attitude toward his studies, preferring to party with his frat brothers. I can't even, I can't picture Ken Ono partying with some frat, but like, what does that even look like? He eventually discovered a genuine enthusiasm for mathematics, became a, pre a professor and started a family. Like that sounds like QED, right? Like the end, beautiful story. 
But fear of failure still weighed so heavily on Ono that he attempted suicide while attending an academic conference. So this is like something we don't even talk about. This is after I love math, I'm married, I'm at a great place, I'm a professor, I've got a family, and I'm still thinking about suicidal thoughts at a, at a math conference. Because I'm just not sure if this is where I want to be. Only after he joined the Institute for Advanced Study himself did Ono begin to make peace with his upbringing. Mm. Through it all, Ono found inspiration from the story of uh, Srinivasa Ram Ramanujan, a mathematical prodigy born into poverty in late 19th century colonial India. Ramanujan received very little formal schooling, yet he still produced thousands of independent mathematical results, some of which, like the Ramanujan theta function, which has found applications in string theory, are still intensely studied. But despite his genius, Ramanujan's achievements didn't come easily. He struggled to gain acceptance from Western mathematicians and dropped out of university twice before dying of illness at the age of 32. Ono served as associate producer and a mathematical consultant for the movie, The Man Who Knew Infinity. Did anybody get to check out that movie? That's the story of, of Ramanujan's life. In his memoir, My Search for Ramanujan, How I Learned to Count, uh, he draws con connections between Ramanujan's life and Ono's own circuitous path to mathematical and emotional fulfillment. He says, I wrote this book to show off my weaknesses, to show off my struggles, Ono said. People who are successful in their careers were not always successful from day one. If you don't take anything else from this conference, I want you to take that last sentence. People who are successful in their careers were always successful on day one. Because you too are not going to be successful on day one. I wasn't successful on day one, or day two, or day 12, or day 800, right? And neither was Ken, who we hold in such high esteem in the mathematical community to this day, right? And so I love sharing this because this is not often what we talk about when we get in mathematical spaces. We hold people up, we're like, oh my gosh, their research is just so great, or their teaching is amazing, and oh, I just love, you know, the book that he wrote is so awesome. But rarely do we talk about the ways that we struggle, that we've struggled in the discipline, and how we might use that as a way to draw people in. Right? Imagine reading that thing and like, oh, well, he's going through some of the same feelings that I feel. So then maybe mathematics could be for me too, right? That we can have these conversations in the discipline. So I wanna talk a little bit, uh, cause I wanna leave lots of time for questions cause y'all got questions. Like y'all got lots and lots of questions. So I wanna give you lots of times for questions. Uh, I wanna show you a couple videos uh, of some of the work that I've been able to do uh, with PBS. And so this really came out of, um, out, of, out of the TED talk, which was a TEDx local TEDx talk that one of my students was on a committee in 2014, I think 2015. And um, it was a Claremont College's TEDx event. And I had like three kids under five. And she was like, hey, can you give one of these TEDx talks? And I was like, no. And she was like, oh, Prof. Williams, you'd be so great, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, oh, uh -uh, I got these kids, you know. And, um, and so she begged and begged. And I was like, why do you want me to do it? She was like, well, we didn't get a lot of Harvey Mudd students last year, so we just thought, like, if we could get a Mudd professor, like, just any random, just, like, a Mudd professor, like, maybe more Mudd students would come. That was, like, that was the selling point. And I was just like, well, really, no. Like, you don't even want me in particular. You just want, like, person from Harvey Mudd. And so um, I reluctantly sort of agreed because I thought, well, worst case, this will make me like make a talk for the public, like sort of a more general math talk, because all my math talks up until that point had been um, some version of my PhD work, you know, like a colloquium talk. So I was like, oh, this will give me a chance to think about math to an audience who isn't in a math, math, math department. So I agreed, and um, I said, well, what's the topic? She said, it's storytelling. And I was like, do you even know what I do? Like storytelling. Lord knows I don't tell stories. Like what? Like what? Um, and so if you've seen the TED Talk, it's, it's me saying, like, what story does this data tell? What story does this data Like, that is literally, like, me trying to connect storytelling to, to, to the TED Talk. Um, 
So anyway, that, that came out, and then the folks at TED, 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 saw it, and they were like, this is a pretty good talk. Like, we should, like, upgrade it and put it on the TED website. And then, and then that's kind of when it blew up. But half of those are, like, my mom watching it every day. <laughs> so no shame. There's no shame. Um, and so, uh, so, so Nova reached out. Okay, so, so then, so they saw the TED Talk, and then we did Nova Wonders, which was like a six-part series, which was a lot of fun. And then they were like, Talithia, we should give you your own show. We, we should do, you, like, do a math show. And they had already gotten some funding. So when they came to me with the idea, I was like, ooh, yes, let's look at like, how data transforms society. And they were like, no, 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 we were thinking you could do zero and infinity. And I was just like, nobody wants to do zero and infinity. Like, that's just boring. Like, zero? And infinity? Like, no, 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 no. Let's do, like, so I had these ideas, and they were like, well, you know, the Templeton Foundation has given us some money, so let's do zero and infinity. I was like, okay, zero and infinity. Um, and then it became, like, this amazing thing. Because, you know, my concept of zero and infinity are sort of how we learn it. Like, it's just, like, I learned zero so that I can do a lot of other stuff. <laughs> learn infinity because I need to use limits. But it's not, like, something that I just dream about at night. Like, oh, infinity, I'm just so excited, you know. Um, so, so this was really fun for me because it also changed my perception of these things that I really take for granted. Right. Here is the clip, the first clip, and I'm going to hold it over here. So that's the, that's the promo. Um, so I got to travel around, and we taped this during COVID. So it was really, you can sort of look in the bottom here where you see like the, the, um, the crew has on mask. Uh, I think I had to take like three or four COVID tests a day. It was like, did you get COVID this morning? Let me just make sure. Um, and, and then we sort of had a closed in set where we had these scenes where we were outside. This is so different from anything I thought I would do as a math professor. That's also why I'm sharing it. Like I didn't come to Harvey Mudd and be like, oh, I can't wait to do a TV show. Um, so, so this is like out of my comfort zone in a way because it was stress, stretching him in a, me in a way that I had never imagined being stretched, right? It was something I never imagined doing. And, uh, and, it, and I found that it was a lot of fun. I actually had a good time doing it, which was really interesting. Uh, we did this scene with, with Eugenia Chang that was looking at infinity and uh, how can we understand different um, levels of infinity and how do we help the public grasp infinity? So we did a, a shot with Hilbert's Hotel where we're walking through and like, like we're in a hotel and, and we did some animation around that. Uh, Steve Strogatz, who's at Cornell, and I did a section on pizza, which I brought that clip, so I'll, I'll let you see that. And then uh, notice this archer, Paralympic archer, so he's got one arm. And we were in Arizona uh, doing a shot on Zeno's Paradox. And so we were doing sort of this, uh, this shot with an arrow. And it was so humbling because he was like amazing. And he would like use his teeth. And I was like both hands and it would just like go off into the, into the distance. Like I didn't even hit the target. Um, so I learned a lot uh, doing these as well. And so I wanted to bring a couple clips just to share with you. This first one is on Zeno's Paradox. Ooh, trying to explain to the public something that we take for granted, right? You, I wish I could show you all the emails of people who are like, look, no, this stick figure thing, they're going to get to the wall. <laughs> like, eventually, I just know they're going to get to the wall. Explain to me how they're not going to get to the wall. I'm like, I got to teach today. I'm so sorry. I cannot respond and explain how they get to the wall, but tr they don't get to the wall. You know, they're like, there's this pot. They got to get to the wall. Um, so, so it's really fun, too, because, because, you know, like, we're easy to be found. You know, you can find me online. And so I get all kinds of dissertations from folks who want to mansplain. Oh, my gosh. That's, that's a whole separate talk of, like, you know what? When you did this part, let me tell you why you were wrong and what it should have been. I've got links to my articles and books below. You can reference that for next. But like, I kid you not. I'm like, okay, well, thank you, sir, for... Um, for that thorough analysis. Uh, this last one I'll do is, is on understanding infinity. This was the shot that we did actually at MoMath, the Museum of Mathematics in New York, with Steve Strogatz, and it was about pizza. So this is a fun one. I love that. Infinity's your friend. Um, 
Uh, if, if you're ever working with uh, K through 12, there are lots of resources. These actual videos are actually freely available on uh, PBS. You just have to sign up for an account as an instructor, and you can um, show these videos. There's also a Google Classroom set up with activities to help uh, students by different grade levels learn it. So there's like sixth through eighth, you know, ninth and 10th, 11th and 12th, and so they really break it down to help students understand those concepts. So that's really exciting. This was the one for Zeno's Paradox. So they actually give you like support material for teachers, support for your students, and then like an example to help your students understand that. So that was really a great plus to see that like this can really be taken into the classroom. Um, the last thing I'll share is uh, I've also had a chance to do voiceover, because apparently my voice sounds pretty amazing. Uh, and so, um, so, so one of the producers was like, hey, Zalithia, we're doing this thing with BBC on the universe, and we'd love for you to do, like, voice for this five-part series on the universe. I'm like, I am not James Earl Jones. And, you know, and so, and it's, it's with BBC. So on the Zoom, like, everyone's like, well, uh, this is Pippa from the UK, and I'm just so excited to be with you, Dr. Williams. And I was just like, oh, anybody should be doing this on your end, like, not me. Um, so this was really, really exciting to do, Universe Revealed. It's actually on Amazon, and when I looked it up, my kids were like, Mom, it stars you? And I was like, I'm not even in it. I'm, I'm literally just the narrator. Like, there's so many awesome people in it. Um, but there is a clip that was one of my favorite clips to do, so I wanted to share this with you. This was for, um, oh gosh, uh, uh, The Big Bang. And so it was like the moment of the Big Bang, and so we're like narrating it, and it was just like music and my voice, and so they're like, Talithia, this is a really heavy moment because your voice is going to like usher in the beginning of the universe. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, all right then. Uh, so we had to practice a long time with me saying the Big Bang, the Big Bang, the Big Bang. Okay, all right, y you'll, you'll see how it came out. One reason that this was so special for me, um, because growing up uh, in my faith community in the church, I would often read these verses about like how the universe was created and you know in the beginning. And so to narrate it, I was like, oh my gosh, mom, I'm like narrating Genesis 1-1, you know. Oh. <laughs> so that was really beautiful for me. Um, there's one thing I do want to share about impact, uh, and it's about a, a little girl named Zoe, a fourth grader who reached out to me uh, a year ago. Um, and she had to dress up as someone for Black History Month. And she was like, I want to be you for Black History Month. I was like, Zoe, baby girl, you're not, I'm not old enough for you to be me. Like, listen, I think you got to be dead or like at least 70 or older. right? And so she's like, no, I want to be you and I'm going to dress up as you. And so I was like, okay, well, um, so she interviewed me and like, you know, where I went to school. And I was like, well, what are you going to wear? Because I don't really have an outfit. Like, it's in a white coat. And so her mom uh, sent me this picture of her for... It. So um, it really is uh, true that when you uh, have outreach and when you reach out and touch people, you just never know uh, what kind of impact you can have on their lives. So thank you. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I think we have time for well, one question. Quick. Okay. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I remember when I was growing up, I watched a lot of like Discovery Channel documentaries yes. and I remember ones with Neil deGrasse Tyson mm -hmm. and I remember being little and kind of wanting to be Neil deGrasse Tyson right. when I grew up. Right, Did Were we there all? any like science communicators that you think inspired you and in the way that you do your, your show and your outreach activities? Yeah, I mean, I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. I love Mayim uh, Balak. I mean, like it's, uh, but there aren't very many, right? When you Google is, you know, there's, um, uh, who's the, the science guy? Uh, Bill Nye. Right? Like, we're all like, Bill, not a science guy. You know, I mean, and so, but, but there's not a lot. And so I think you should all see yourselves in this space. Like, there's so much room in this space for more science communicators. Neil is getting up there. Like, you know, we're all leaning on Neil, and he's like, look, I'm trying to retire. You know, who's coming behind Neil? And who looks like us who's coming behind him uh, to, to be in that space? So that's, that's, that's great. And I, if you, I'm doing the session, a session on communication, communicating mathematics 
schematics uh, where we can talk more about this. But I think there's room for you in this space, even if the thought makes you feel uncomfortable, as it did me. Um, but you can totally do it, and, and I'd, I'd be happy to help you get there. Okay, I want to keep us on track, but I'm here. You know, I'm here all day. So come find me. <laughs>